All right, so <clears throat> the last thing we did was a little bit with HIV and evolution of HIV. We're going to stick with that theme, <clears throat> but I want to return a little bit to uh, phylogenetic trees. We've talked a little bit about these. But we haven't really talked about how you make them or how you use them to answer specific scientific questions. So uh, we can make phylogenetic trees uh, using a variety of different approaches. Uh, the first approach might be to build the tree using specific traits that organisms have. So <clears throat> this would be a, a phylogenetic tree that's constructed in this way. We might take a bunch of uh, traits that Linnaeus first described for mammals, for example, <clears throat> and use that to construct a phylogenetic tree here uh, with the ancestral mammal here and the rest of the mammalian lineage listed here. Okay? <clears throat> when you start to group the mammals by traits, uh, one group here called the monotremes. These are the egg-laying mammals, spiny, anteater, duckbill, platypus. Uh, the fact that they uh, lay eggs rather than have live birth uh, gets them placed off to the side as less related to these other two main groups. One of those groups being the marsupials, and the other group here called the Eutherians. <clears throat> the Eutherians, that's just another term for the placental mammals. And then within this group called the placental mammals, we could begin to break out uh, distinct groups based on the traits. So, for example, the carnivores the rodents based on tooth morphology, and we could lay out this phylogenetic tree based on traits. Uh, another approach that became much more common several decades ago <coughs> was to use DNA molecules themselves. <coughs> After all, traits derived from information within the DNA, <coughs> wouldn't it be better to use this very basic fundamental level rather than using something that's based on this fundamental level. So <clears throat> what we could do is uh, find a particular section of the DNA. <clears throat> Let's say we could identify a particular gene, and then what we'll do is we will look at the sequence of letters within this gene, right, adenine, cytosine, thymine, guanine, and use that as an indicator of relatedness. So if I could find a gene that was present in every organism on the planet, then what I could do is compare the sequence of letters among species for that gene. Individuals that shared lots more letters in common, we would say are more closely related, diverged more recently in time, and those species that had letters that differed greatly, less related, longer since divergence. So the first thing to do is identify one of these genes that is present in all organisms. So uh, normally I would torture a few people and I, I torture you in class trying to get you to come up with this, <clears throat> but what we're going to use are uh, specific ribosomal RNA genes. Recall that <clears throat> DNA codes for protein, but it also, in a sense, codes for RNA molecules like uh, messenger RNA that will be used to make protein, but also transfer RNAs, ribosomal RNAs, uh, <clears throat> siRNAs, hnRNAs, whatever else we could think of. <clears throat> well, all organisms have ribosomal RNA genes because all organisms have to build ribosomes and they need to build ribosomes because they ultimately need to build protein. So what we'll do is, is find <clears throat> this ribosomal RNA gene across all organisms, bacteria, archaea, plants, animals, fungi, protists, whatever else we could find, 
let's just look at a bunch of these sequences. So <clears throat> let's imagine then that what we have is a database that's been constructed for each species, right? There's species one, species two, and is a series of letters. And then for species two, we have a series of letters, right? In species three, we have a series of letters. The idea is that species 1 and species 2 would be more closely related to each other because even though there are differences in the sequences, there are fewer of those differences than exist between species 2 and 3 or between 1 and 3. Okay, now this seems kind of trivial, but Imagine uh, decades ago trying to take these long sequences, which may be thousands of letters long, and asking a computer to figure out which sequences are more related to which other sequences, <clears throat> where I may have, I don't know, several hundred of these sequences, one from each of my species. Now, I can remember those old days, because I was around for those old days, uh, <clears throat> There was a guy down the hall when I was in graduate school in the early 90s uh, who did a lot of this work. He did a lot of phylogenetic tree building for a group of fish called cichlids. <clears throat> the cichlids are present in uh, Lake Tanganyika, Lake Malawi. Uh, I can't think of the other one, Lake Victoria. <clears throat> in Africa... And there's been a lot of speciation among these fish, so it's interesting to try to figure out which ones are more closely related to which other ones. But in any event, he used to have to uh, build in money in his grants to have computers do this kind of work. And the computers at that time, the only ones that had the processing ability to do all of this kind of work were uh, President Los Alamos, the physics lab that the government controls, and he would book time at like 2 a.m. in the morning. It would cost him a thousand bucks to have, you know, a half hour's worth of time on one of these Cray supercomputers. Uh, I like to tell this story because uh, currently your cell phone has enough processing power to do what this guy was trying to use a supercomputer for back in those days. I remember around the same time I bought my first desktop computer and it had one megabyte of RAM. Right, and uh, I couldn't afford two because that would have uh, cost more money than I could afford at the time. Okay? All right. <clears throat> so, you take all those sequences, you line them up, and you produce this sort of a phylogenetic tree. So this is the one uh, uh, that really kind of uh, lays out the prokaryotes versus the eukaryotes. We have uh, the kingdoms as they currently exist, <clears throat> but using that ribosomal RNA, uh, this phylogenetic tree here, the universal phylogenetic tree determined from ribosomal RNA sequence comparisons, this is the same as the previous tree, it's just in order to get everything to fit on the slide, they have to flip some of these uh, lines, instead of pointed all up toward the top, you kind of rearrange them so that you can fit it all on the slide. But notice that there are kind of uh, three main groups here. There's this group of species here, a group of species here, and a group of species here. This led to the uh, modern conception of domains, domain eubacteria or domain bacteria, domain archaea, and domain eukarya. Is that okay? All right, now, in these phylogenetic trees where you have a single ancestor leading to a group of individuals, so on the phylogenetic tree, let's see if I can draw one of these here, Right, this would be a phylogenetic tree here. <clears throat> right, there's the ancestor of everybody in the tree. And then you have this 
individual here that gave rise to all of these individuals. It's the ancestor of all of these. And then there looks like there's another one there. In our tree here, I'm seeing three of those. These uh, points here that give rise to this, this whole thing here is called a clade. So the three clades of life are the three domains. That phylogenetic tree that we looked at over here, here is a clade here. The placental mammals represents a clade. They all come back to a single individual type. Okay? You can build phylogenetic trees using different approaches besides uh, DNA sequences or traits. This particular one was used, uh, done using blood proteins. The idea is you have a sequence of amino acids, right? And you compare that to another sequence of amino acids, right? And you look at the similarities in the sequences. The more similar these amino acid sequences are between two individuals for the same protein, the more closely related they would be. So that's been done here for this uh, group of animals within Ursidae, the bear family. <clears throat> and uh, notice here they've picked out two kind of clades, in this case they're families. There's the Ursidae, the bear family, and the <clears throat> Procyanidae, right? The lesser panda and the raccoon. And then you have the ancestor of both of these families. And then based on this phylogenetic tree, the brown bear and the polar bear would be the most closely related. They would have the most recent common ancestor. Okay? All right. Now, notice that for this one and this one, there's a timeline on here. <clears throat> so how do we get a timeline onto a phylogenetic tree. How can we make determinations that allow us to say when particular groups of organisms appeared on the planet? Or the ancestor for the bears and the procyanidae, that divergence occurred a little over 30 million years ago. The bear family comes into existence a, a little less than 23 million years ago. How do we do that? Well, the technique was first worked out uh, by two individuals. <clears throat> Here. Uh, Zucker Candle <clears throat> and Pauling. This is the Pauling, Linus Pauling. You should have come across him before in MCB. He's to blame for the protein structure, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure of proteins. He first described those and presented those and got a Nobel Prize in Chemistry, or Nobel Prize in Medicine and Physiology for his work there. He was this close to a Nobel Prize in Medicine and Physiology for his work with DNA structure. Uh, Watson and Crick beat him to it. And he also had a, a Nobel Peace Prize for his work with the atomic bomb. Uh, Linus Pauling is a big name in biochemistry. But he also shows up here in biology, providing with Zucker Candle a mechanism for putting a timeline on phylogenetic trees. So to understand what uh, they came up with, let's think about this DNA molecule. Now this DNA molecule is present in an individual, and when the individual has offspring, the DNA molecule has to be replicated. So we're going to make copies of this DNA molecule, and send copies to the next generation. So let's say this individual has, I don't know, two offspring. Those two offspring would each have inherited a copy of this original DNA molecule. Now, that process would continue with each generation. Each DNA molecule is going to be copied and then sent to the next generation. So if this individual has one offspring and this individual has three offspring, right, we now have 
copies of these original two molecules, and we can imagine this process taking place generation after generation after generation. Now, each time the DNA is copied, during DNA replication, the enzymes have particular jobs, and one of those jobs uh, of DNA polymerase 3 is to place in the correct nucleotides against the template strand. But mistakes are going to be made, and whenever these mistakes are made, we introduce mutations into the molecule itself. So I've introduced, let's say, a mutation into the molecule here. That mutation is going to be copied into the next generation. Because after all, the copying mechanism doesn't know that that was a mistake. It faithfully copies the mistake along with all of the other DNA. And then my expectation is that this mistake or mutation has now become part of the DNA molecule. I could, at some other point in time, make another mistake, and that mistake is now part of the DNA molecule. In the other lineage, I could also make mistakes during DNA replication. I could introduce one here that would be copied faithfully in subsequent generations. I could also introduce a mutation here that shows up in subsequent generations. Now, the idea is whenever mistakes are made, <coughs> mutations occur, and these mutations end up being incorporated into the DNA molecule. And as they're incorporated into the DNA molecule, we have this idea of the accumulation of mutations. Right? We're going to accumulate <coughs> mutations over time, <coughs> and the longer we do this process, right, the more generations, I should say, the more of these mutations accumulate within molecules. Now, <coughs> the difference between these two DNA molecules is not all that different. One generation has passed, there have been mutations introduced, but really only one. On the other hand, if I compare these two DNA molecules to each other, they differ at many more locations because of the 